Hello, welcome to Noxy by Kali JNS. And today we continue with the Black American series. And we are on part 17, which will cover Black Americans in music and art. And Black Americans are globally known for their music and arts, so it's important to document the history as much as possible so that for generations, people of our historical and blood lineage can reflect on their ancestors and so that we can reminisce on our ancestors today. So let's begin. So as we know, uh, black Americans have always been into music um, since the days of the Negro spiritual, but we're gonna cover more of our modern day takes in music starting from 1910, which was the like the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance started with the premiere of Granny Mame, the Writers of Dream, and some on the Serenian, which were Negro plays. And uh, the Harlem Renaissance, not only did they focus on theater, but also poetry and uh, music and literature was very big. So during the uh, Great Depression, there was this thing called the New Deal Federal Theater Project. And so the, the New Deal projects uh, created opportunities for black American scholars that wanted to um, document uh, black American music, oral history, folklore, and you name it. So one of the uh, first scholars that wanted to document the Harlem Renaissance and this, the history of black Americans in music and arts was anthropologist and author Zora Neale Hurston. So we all pretty much familiar with that ancestor and she uh, collated a lot of our um, information for us, as well as sociologist Lewitt Way Jones and folklorist John Wesley Work III. And other scholars who participated uh, was educator Willis Lawrence James. They documented all of this information and it is now included in the Library of Congress. And we can get some of this information online, but uh, many of the things I'm gonna tell you are at the Library of Congress and can be easily um, researched. So the Harvard Renaissance uh, grew out of the Great Migration to the North, as you guys know, and even before then. And industrialization was affecting uh, the cities. So it created a whole new subculture within American culture. And it permeated literature, religion, discourse, music, and everything. So let's start with literature. So in 1917, Herbert Harrison um, was considered the father of Harlem radicalism. He founded the Liberty League and The Voice, which were um, newspapers, the first newspaper. And his organizations were, uh, and newspapers were political, but they also emphasized the arts. They, he loved to include poetry uh, by black Americans. So Herbert Harrison's newspaper really uh, solidified the Harlem Renaissance and, and uh, promulgated the culture back in those days, as well as Alan Locke's anthology, The New Negro, which was considered the cornerstone of this uh, revolution. The anthology featured uh, several black Americans and uh, poets, uh, such as Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, Zora Neale Hurston, and Ann Spencer. And this was also the start of like the, the poetry and the jazz in the background. That's when this started during this time. And many of the poets of the Harlem Renaissance uh, tied in the jazz and when and during their performances. So that's how it started with, you know, they sang the poetry and they got the, someone in the background playing the little drums and a little jazz to set the mood, set the tone, get the candles. That started back then. So the Harlem Renaissance also impacted religion. So during this time, the Moore Science Temple of America became very popular and this was established. Um, Islam had uh, came to Harlem as well as uh, the uh, black Hebrew of Israelites were discussing their um, belief system as well as uh, people, you know, dabbing, making a uh, voodoo and hoodoo and Santeria more um, acceptable during this time. So the arts influenced those religions as well to an extent. Another component of black American art um, that was inspired before the Harlem Renaissance and during the, and during the Harlem Renaissance was jazz and blues. 
So blues have been around for a very, very long time. It started in the late 19th century and obviously early 20th century. And um, the blues began to emerge uh, as agricultural work songs, but they were uh, turned from like, you know, songs that were sung on the railroads and work and actually like, and were actually like produced as records. And also ethnographers found out that a lot of the blues was started, you know, in prison uh, by black men, by blues artists such as John Avery Lomax and uh, his son, you know, and they, they would record songs like the Rock Island Line, which was sung by Joe Battle and a group of convicts. So blues stem from pain and working. Again, it was the agricultural setting, industrial setting, prison setting. And this is how blues came to emerge. And it became very mainstream. And then that's when the development of desert blues uh, began to take place. And that was sung by Hattie Ellis. And that's when people started to realize like, oh, blues can actually be like entertainment. Like this can actually be something that can be recorded. So as we know, W.C. Handy is sometimes referred to the father of the blues. And he was a, a, a black American composer and musician. And he studied various forms of music and traveled all around the country. And he composed and influenced different styles of blues, such as the Memphis blues, ragtime, and uh, all of those things. Other people who were pioneers of the blues genre, and these are all black Americans, by the way, was Huddy Lead Betty. Was Huddy Lead Belly. And he was born 1888 to 1949. Vera Hawes was another pioneer. So many blues singers, they made their living touring and they they did not really make a lot of, um, you know, like these big time records because a lot of people, a lot of uh, the mainstream society, white people would steal a lot of black music, um, give them janky deals uh, and take their records and try to record them and, and, you know, whatever they heard in these clubs, they would try to reverse engineer it and, and try to put it out and, you uh, steal their intellectual property so this was a very big thing with the blues jazz soul actually almost every black american genre has examples of intellectual property theft uh, janky deals the, you know this is just something that the black american has always had to deal with and still as you can see the music is still one of the most influential in the world so i want to uh, honor some more of our blues singers like Bessie Smith, which was she was born 1894 and died in 1937. I want to honor Jutrude May Rainey, 1886 through 1999. They popularized blues across the racial divide. So we also we can't we can't talk about blues without talking about Muddy Waters, 1913 through 1983. We got Robert Johnson, 1911 uh, through 1938. We have David Honeyboy. Edwards, which is 1915 through 2011. We got the beautiful, talented Billie Holiday, which is 1915 through 1959. And of course, we got the BB King, who is 1925, and, and he's still alive, I believe. So, all of these artists, these are the Black American ancestors, and they push the blues in the direction, you know. That, that formulated a, a, a jazz and rock. So these were pioneers who used their brilliance and talent and song to soothe the, the hearts and souls of the black American. And it spilled over into influencing the broader American culture. So when people say, oh, the black American genre don't have any culture, it's just simply ridiculous because the, the blues genre came from the chain gang, literally, and damn agriculture. So this would have never happened had the black american not had that experience in america so that's where blues stem from and then all of the singers and all they sung about their pain a lot of these people you know they was shooting up you know some drugs you know to deal with this the, the extreme pain that they were in and making the those belly aching heart aching amazing music like these blues uh songs when you listen to them you could feel the soul of these people you could feel the soul of my ancestors and every single last one of these songs and that was what was blues was about was expressing the soul and um ju that's just the way the black american is we like to express our souls very very emotional people something that uh we do have to work on as far as too much emotion but by and large that is just the way the black american is 
we like to express our our heart and soul through music and the arts so now that we talked about the blues let's honor just re, let's remember those ancestors who started blues we gotta we gotta remember them now let's talk about some jazz now we know the black american loves jazz that's actually my favorite genre of music since i was a kid i never was a fan of rap i was a fan of the conscious rap of course but i never like i was listening to damn john coltrane when my friends was listening to you know pretty ricky and little wayne all that craziness I, I've always had a deep, deep connection to jazz in my soul. So we got to talk about jazz because that is what the black American loves dearly. So jazz, you know, in particular in the Harlem Renaissance, um, it was, you know, um, more accepted by more of the black American elites. But also, you know, um all black americans of a socioeconomic status did engage in jazz and the traditional jazz band was composed of brass instruments and was considered you know the symbol of the south and uh they added the piano which was considered an instrument of the wealthy so the combining of those instruments really enabled black americans to create the jazz genre and it, it really became so popular and it was an all-time high innovation you know so remember jazz performers and are some of our composers such as Ubi Blake, Noble Silsey, Jelly Roll Moulton, Lucky Roberts, James P. Johnson, Willie the Lion Smith, Fats Waller, Ethel Waters, Adelaide Hall, Florence Mills, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Fletcher Henderson, Sun Ra, John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, Charles Mingus. These are our ancestors. These are black Americans who literally, you know, just tore the frame out of making this jazz genre and uh, composing some of the most amazing music ever to exist even on this planet. So jazz is very very important to the black american and as we know we all know about the duke ellington's you know he gained popularity during the the harlem renaissance and um he was a gifted composer people said duke ellington was like you know uh he was amazing and he was eccentric but he loved to make his music and during this time, believe it or not, this is when jazz started, like a lot of white people started to notice jazz and want to copy and also wanted to just uh, play, learn about, okay, why is black people, you know, coming up with something new? So it became very interesting to them. And even some white composers started to use uh, black American poets in their songs and started to, you know, try to, you know, do this jazz thing. So let's remember, like all those jazz players that I just mentioned, let's remember our ancestors that let's let's keep their name alive because jazz start was like the beginning of like you know the other genres that was birthed from it such as like neo soul and stuff so now let's talk about black american gospel everybody knows the the love that black americans have for gospel i grew up listening to gospel you can't tell me nothing about no you know and a lot of us are not even christian now but we still know them damn gospel songs we we love kirk franklin's song stump that i mean you could not get no stump and you know and i'm gonna tell y'all this and you know i always bring spiritual elements to all of my videos pretty much anyway so again it's a very unorthodox take on historical documentation at the scholarly level and i'm okay with that but um you know one of the songs that even our ancestors love so much and they, they can't get enough of when the black American play this song on the other side. I'm going to tell y'all something and hear me loud. Now, all of us know this song, the majority of black Americans. But I'm telling you from the spiritual side, the ancestors have said multiple times, play that song from play that song. And guess what it is, black people? Guess what it is? Melodies from Heaven by Kirk Franklin. Remember that song? Melodies from, you know, I can't sing because, you know, they doing all types of stuff with the copyright. But, you know, they love that song. And that's a part of, you know, the gospel genre. But we know gospel started way before Kirk Franklin. Okay? We got, we got the Clark sisters. 
Now, you can't talk about gospel without talking about the Clark sisters and their anointed voice. Now, we all know that song, Jesus is a Love Song. Go and type that in YouTube right now, and you can see the black woman, she's belting out from her soul, talking about Jesus, but truly uh, connecting into other dimensions and not being aware of it, because a black person singing like, black people singing like that, is just insane like i could not believe them clark sisters was singing that damn good you know what i mean like listen to that jesus is a love song jesus i think that's what it's called jesus love. yeah type that in youtube and go listen to that performance where they performing it live and tell me you know is those voices not anointed and if there's not angels in the background listening i know i sound crazy right now but this is what the black american does you know just naturally we love gospel and you can't talk up, you know, we got the Kimber Rails, the Yolanda Adams. We grew up listening to all of that. And I remember those songs, Brighter Day, and 99 and a Half Won't Do. All of these songs that we love. And of course, uh, John K.P. You know, we love John K.P. I think he's still, I th all of these people is still alive, you know. And they they influence Black American culture, believe it or not, because most Black Americans we know a lot of these gospel songs, you know, and, and we enjoyed them, you know. The Precious Lamb of God. I haven't listened to these songs in about 10, 20 years, except for Melodies from Heaven. I do listen to quite frequently. Uh, same with I listen to Kim Burrell and I listen to um, uh, John K. P. Remember Fred Hammond. So we honor these uh, black American gospel singers because they really, you know, kept a smile on our face growing up as kids. They kept a smile on our parents' face when they were going through things. And sometimes, you know, that Sunday sermon with those, with the gospel section in the sermon, you know, in that session that we used to have for about 30, 40 minutes and the praise and worship, you know, that really, really you know made so many black americans day and it's still making black americans day uh i don't know this but i used to sing in the church choir as a kid and i can actually sing very very quite well and when i say um that that made my day that soothed my i don't know like singing those singing in the choir was the shit you know and we used to sing of course we used to sing brighter day you know and we used to sing um uh I mean, it's so many gospel songs but i used to be in two choirs i was a chautauqua county uh, choir and i was just you know in the baptist black choir where all of us black singing and we loved it and it was we used to go to rehearsal you know and sing on sundays at the youth choir and the adult choir so that's what i like to do i used to be in the church choir and take it very serious you know love singing the gospel songs and listening to them so some people they speculate that gospel started in the south and um uh, gospel has strong use of harmony that's how the black american composers when they made these songs back in the day even started in 1912 with mahalia jackson so um you know we focus more on the harmony and euphoric uh rhythm so this is just something that uh we started it became popular you know in 1940 but it was always something that we did gospel was always a staple for black americans so now you know we want to remember the birmingham sunlights you know which was a gospel uh, from Al alabama uh the northern kentucky brotherhood singers we want to remember them and uh aubrey Gent. so we want to thank all uh, ancestors who contributed to the black american gospel as well as uh, black americans who are still alive who have soothed uh, many black americans hearts throughout the whole world including kirk franklin who came up with so many songs that we love and mary mary and all of them we that we love to sing to this day now many of us again not even christians anymore especially in the millennials we're moving more towards traditional african uh, religions you know hoodoo uh and all types of other stuff that we like to do we, some of us are moving to ifa and all this but we still are singing these songs to this day because those songs have changed our lives and they're they are a part of culture not just like religion it's like these are like cultural staples like you cannot you know avoid black american gospel if you're a black american and other 
staples of besides gospel we had we had we cover blues we got gospel we got jazz you know of course hip-hop but then you know actual staples such as like the Motown Records which was founded in 1959 in Detroit Michigan and obviously that label focused on black American artists and it helped establish you know black singers you know in in the the whole global cultural scene you know because it it, it styled a, a very a certain style of soul music which combined R&B and gospel and elements of gospel so that's this is where R&B started to form and remember and and again i was a kid that could not really relate to a lot of um the music that was in my time like 11 12 13 14 15 like stuff that was out that my friends would listen to i i really um because i have a very old soul and i i did not like the aspect that the uh black american music culture had uh started to uh turn to during that time you know like you know i would say uh, 2000 and 2006 to and to now like I would say after 2005 maybe I really couldn't understand like a lot of stuff that was on the radio um so I always cling to the Motown singers even to this day and we know many of them include the mayor recalls Marvin Gaye and, and Marvin Gaye that's 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 our favorite and he was born in 1939 and he died in 1984 of course you got the temptations and the supremes okay in 1961 you had Steve Lynn Hardaway Morris who um recorded at the age of 11 and guess what his name is you all know who that is that's Stevie Wonder so we love Stevie Wonder to this day. He's still alive. He's, he, he has a, a brilliant catalog of music. He is a freaking genius. Um, and we honor him. And that is one of my favorite singers. You know, I like Blue Magic. Remember Blue Magic? They was the shit. Now, you, now, I don't know if he was Motown, but I'm just going off the cuff now. Remember Bobby Womack. Bootsy Collins. So that's literally what i listen to to this day like if you you would you would come chill with me and i mean i like neo soul you know like the jill scotts and all of that and mary J. and i listen to that but if you really catch me when you when you catch me in my normal act we got the bootsy collins we playing you know the, the, the bobby Womack, you know and that's those were my favorites and of course marvin gay the after party that's one that remember the after dance Remember that song? And um, I Want You. Those are my favorite, some of my favorite songs that I've listened to since I was a kid because I was raised um, by an elder, um, my adopted mom. And I, honestly, that's all she would listen to in the car. So I honestly don't even remember. Like being able to listen to, like, say, like more of stuff in my, in my age bracket or that was like current was a rarity so that's another reason why i grabbed up grappled onto that music which is our black american music um because i could not again i'm telling you i could not relate to you know that you know the stuff that was on um you know the the radio except for like destiny's child like cisco or something like that but when that rap started to just really take a turn for the worse you know when it really just got so ridiculous when i started hearing about shooting up and killing and all this craziness and and slapping your mama up and all that I, I really could not take that even as a kid i just knew it was low vibration for our people and actually ruining our culture so i didn't play that and you know i'll listen to the most deaf most deaf was the shit back then he's still the shit you know and um you know black star was cool with we, which we, we, of kylie i don't know what he up to now he i hear he he done lost it um you know common all of those uh neo so jay dilla we can't talk about black american music without talking about jay dilla now he's a producer he produced many of y'all favorite hits and he produced shit for kanye west even on his deathbed he died jay dilla died um he was big with slum village he produced a lot of they stuff um he produced common stuff erica badu uh, the roots you know so jay dilla was was really big uh amazing very talented so look up jay dilla he is a producer 
We got a lot of beats out. You know, Dwele, J. Dillon, Dwele did a lot of stuff, you know. And Dwele is one of my favorites too. So growing up, if it was current stuff I was listening to, that was definitely it. Like I remember being a teenager listening to J. Dilla very heavily in Dwele. Like, and uh, again, I remember my friends kind of looking at me like, we listen to Trey songs, you know? <laughs> and it's no knock to, you know, I'm not trying to knock the current stuff at all because everything has its place in this universe. But um, sometimes I feel sometimes out of place, you know, you know. So as far as um, my age group, so um, I just gravitated towards the neo soul type stuff, and of course, you know, um, the old school, the most. So let's get back on track. I know that was a tangent, but um, remember, we're now we're on Motown Records and Rhythm and Blues, Black Americans and R&B. And I want to talk about more of our ancestors and Black Americans who are still alive, you know, who were on Motown. We want to honor Jimmy Ruffin, the originals, Gladys Knight and the Pips, of course, Martha and the Vandellas. The Velvelettes, the Spinners, the Monitors, <laughs> and Chris Clark. So some of these are not as popular as you know, like like you know, like the Gladys Knight or the Supremes or Temptations. But we honor everybody that contributed to Black American music, in particular R and B, um, jazz, and you know, all of these things. So let's keep going because Motown was huge for Black Americans. The Four Tops, of course, the Jackson Five. The Commodores, Rick James, and even more, you know, recent Motown um, names like Boys to Men and Johnny Gill. We all know who that is. And uh, 702, they were, you know, during the final years of the Motown label before it was absorbed into Universal Music Group. So that is Motown. Motown, you know, they had a, a, a Motown sound, which was referred to as like a soul music. It was actually a trademark. They used tambourines to accent the backbeat. They used electric bass guitar lines and chord structures and call and response singing style that uh, can only be found in uh, black American gospel music. So that is the Motown records. We covered R&B and soul music. And, and now we're going to do hip hop. Um, hip hop was a brilliant invention, you know, to really deal with, you know, the uh, they had a very much revolutionary aspect when hip hop first started. That's why you hear the songs "Fight the F Powers That Be," you know. Um, it was a cultural, uh, um, it was an art movement, but it was, uh, you know, created, you know, obviously by Black Americans in Bronx, New York City. A lot of other immigrants are trying to like claim that they created hip hop when they have no genre. Uh, that can't even that they don't can't you can't even be found in their own cultures if they created it you would be able to go back and look at their country and see elements of uh hip-hop before black americans uh collated it to an actual new genre um so hip-hop music uh, obviously includes uh rap um and uh rapping and uh, djing and emceeing you know in a uh, rhyming style which we pretty much all know you always have the DJ mixers, you got beatboxing, and of course you have the fashion aspect of it. A lot hip hop has a fashion aspect. Um, it has a, a, a cultural aspect, such as black parties, uh, spades, you know. Um, so even though hip hop, you know, is obviously a music genre, it has a very much a, a subculture that was started by Black Americans. And hip hop used to do a lot of sampling you know of classic records and they will flip them you know in hip-hop culture so that's how you know the black Americans started because they it started by uh taking blues jazz and folk music and sampling it to you know uh the, the beats to to make new music so in 1990 ronald b stinger savage which is you know somebody uh which is a former member of the zulu nation is credited for coining the term the six elements of the hip-hop movement which was inspired by public enemies recording so the six elements of the hip-hop movement are consciousness awareness civil rights awareness activism awareness justice political awareness and community awareness in music so he is one of the sons of the hip-hop music and to be honest that's when 
you know, honestly, it got co-opted because you talking about fight the powers that be in, and it's like a jungle of times that make me wonder why I keep from going talking like when way black uh, people were originally rapping. Um, it, it had that consciousness element, you know, telling black people you gotta fight. They try car quest. You see, you see, listen to some of their music and stuff, and you know, um, it it, it it had a consciousness element in it. Tr- it truly did. And to be honest, that is more of the hip hop that I like and that most black Americans like. And I honestly think it was systematically um, co-opted. I think that it was infiltrated by very powerful operatives um, uh, that put their money behind it to kind of steer hip hop in a a very toxic direction. And um, hip hop still always has that element of conscious awareness. You can still find people who it utilized the six elements of hip hop always you can always find it even today in 2020 it is not mainstream because they're not putting their money behind it the closest we got i want to say uh kendrick lamar you know as far as you know just having that global mainstream uh power in uh, j cole you know um but for the most part it, it, it took the soul out of that hip hop and, and made it reduced to a commodification of uh just a commodity of of, uh, of 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 just making money and and once you take the soul out of something and you can just you know package it you can find anybody on the streets any nigga on the street and say hey you want a record label hey you want a record deal hey come on you know and um you know seeing these even if they can't rap we've seen this we've seen today rappers in hip-hop uh that have zero talent you know, rapping, becoming double platinum and all this craziness. You're like, how is that? How is that song good? And, that, and then you listen to the song and it's talking about toxic, wretched culture stuff that the black American is not even known for. A lot of these people are not even black American. So something that was so beautiful and so powerful, such as hip hop, um, has taken the turn for the worse. And that's why when you hear me, I'm not trying to look down on like rap and stuff because I obviously I'm listening to uh you know the Jay Dillas and the Slum Villages, you know, and the Roots, uh, and Black Thought in particular. So I'm very much in tune with my culture and community. I know everything that y'all doing around here because I grew up as a Black American, and I I I am bothered very much by uh the the current stuff of our music, you know, and. I do know that again very powerful people have put their money behind um this engine and will only allow uh, certain things to go mainstream and things that are most likely detrimental to the black community and the black family the nuclear black family and black women so if you're going to ask me to co-sign a lot of the toxicity that i see now i will not do it even in the black american series which is a documentation of our history I, I'm not going to co-sign something I know our ancestors are not even really approving of because they're not um, but they do love again the six elements of hip-hop now they on board with that they love that to death they like battle rap because guess what battle rap is the creative uh, ingenuity of the black American which is also a part of hip-hop culture guess who is also a fan of, of battle rap me remember the king of the dot remember smack URL I mean come on the queen of the ring i love queen of the ring you can't tell me you know so um battle rap was the shit and and, and i I don't know what's going on with it now because again once the once these engines once these operatives get behind our stuff it kind of to me it ruins it because i remember when like smack url you know uh remember what loaded lux uh versus calico and all that and it seemed to me to take that that was like like the that was a great battle obviously but um to me it seemed like oh uh, battle rap just got too commercial it just got whack that's kind of just like the verses when the verses was just black americans doing their own little thing during the quarantine being bored it was beautiful it was perfect perfect like erica by doing just scott you know we love just going on instagram and just see it, it was the shit and then they just to me i think apple somebody's behind it I, I don't know who's behind it but to me it's just like the soul is just snatched out of it it just seems so commercial it doesn't have that authenticity to it anymore it, i mean we're still watching it because it's verses it's like our favorite artists that we want to see go head to head you know at each other who got the best catalog of music which they're both most people have awesome 
catalogs, you know. But um, it, it's, it's to me, it's like with anything, and that's what the Black American has to work on is gatekeeping and stop really selling out their culture. You know, really, just some things is better. Even if you, even if say like some, some say something like a versus, you need to make money off of it. And you want to sell tickets. You want to do a private streaming. You don't need a corporate backing for that. You don't need like these huge conglomerates that's going to, you know, suck the soul out of it. Just do everything yourself and, you know, be independent. Just even like, you know, a situation with Bobby Schmurda. Bobby Schmurda, when you get out, you know, if you need um, some advice or you need, you know, someone to talk to, you know, you could reach out to me. But Bobby Schmurda, you learned one of your, one of the most craziest lessons that a black man would ever have to learn in this country and i know that it was many black men that told you not to sign that deal not to sign now there's a lot of things with bobby Schmurda that happened on a spiritual level that i could that i always could sense it always bothered me you know he's been in prison for like eight years and i think he get out next year but the situation with bobby Schmurda always bothered me um not him but i'm saying that situation remember that hot nigga song made that in the hood what uh, almost what, 100 million <laughs> hits just off of his own talent. He didn't need anybody. And from what I understand and how the story go, and this not this may not be true, but he was making anywhere from seven thousand to forty thousand a month independent, just selling tickets and showing up to do the club show. So that was money that was his, 100% his. And you know, people was telling him that we're already in the industry. Don't sign. Just be independent because you're making your money. You don't need to. You're like he, you don't, you don't, don't worry about mainstream. You're already mainstream. Hot nigga was everybody know that song. The hot nigga, and then you know, just somebody called a body about a week ago. We, you know all that stuff. That, that song, and it was a catchy song. And not only that, it's like the power of the Black American soul, where even if they sing it about something ratchet, could just be that worldwide. I think this song got what, like 500 million hits now. I mean, the song, it, it, I mean, come on. And uh, we all knew about Bobby Shmurda. And next thing you know, he signs a record uh, deal after being uh, asked not to, you know, by uh, credible people. Like, I, I don't know if he thought maybe they were hating on him, you know, or like, oh, y'all trying to stop me from, you know. But he ended up signing a record deal. <laughs> and uh, he went from making seven to $40,000 a month as a, pro, you know, projected kid in, in, in New York. And Brooklyn, was it from Brooklyn or uh, Bronx or Harlem? So I don't know, but you know, from Bro in Brooklyn to making nothing after he signed that label. And remember, he went on Twitter and was complaining, saying, "I want out. I feel like a slave. What the fuck is going on with this with this record that I, you know, this deal that I signed? I thought it was for one million, two million dollar deal, but really it was an advance against you know royalties or whatever else, and, and against anything that the artist spends. And they kind of just took his money. I think they might. I don't. Do we even own the rights to Hot Nigga anymore? Do we even own those rights? So you know, so he signed that deal and he regretted it. And I, and I, and them tweets got deleted. And somebody may have the screenshots, but I know for a fact I saw it because again i always followed him because i thought his case was so i thought his ascent was interesting the song was interesting um so just from a sociologist point of view i just was like hmm, this is this is interesting and when we saw him dancing on that table for epic records remember and, and black people's calling it's like why would you do that for the white folks it was nothing but white folks and he dancing on the table with his black so and remember that went viral you know i remember that i think was i in high school no i, I, I was in high school i was in college i don't i don't remember but um so, you know, we seen that and we were kind of like, what are you doing? So people were trying to guide him and let it, cause we all saw it. I saw it. I'm like, oh shit, he about to get ate up by the machine. And they're going to have, I said, they got cases. They listening to his phone cause hip hop police is real. So I'm saying they watching him. They building a the case. And if he don't do what they say, they're going to throw his ass in jail. <laughs> it's something that it's something behind the scenes that happened that he's not even able to say himself. And that's just a fact. As far as how you don't do next thing you know, they get a Rico against everybody, or they 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 they, they already watching you and didn't say if you from the hood and you already engaged in some fuck shit. You know, it's not nothing to to pull a rank. You know, because they already got files and they can make stuff go away if they want to. But if you don't, you know, uh, say you know if you don't get in line, then you and your boys will go to jail. So again, that's stuff that I get from the spiritual side. It's not stuff that, as far as, you know, the part where I feel that he went to jail uh, because of something he refused to do in the background that we don't know of and that he will not speak on. 
and that's just from the spiritual side now was they doing stuff they had no business doing bobby smurda himself didn't but his crew was and they was listening on them phones or whatever and they built up a nice little case against them and threw all their asses in jail and he's still in that deal if i'm not mistaken and and how is he going to get out and, and does he even own the rights to hot nigga and what is going to happen eight years later since we haven't heard from bobby smurda we just have, you know, he's been in prison for crying out loud. So he hasn't been able to release no music. I think he did something with Takashi 69. He might have regretted that because of how Takashi 69 went out. So we don't even know the outcome of that. But you know, Bobby Shmurda, um, a situation like that has happened with plenty of hip hop artists. And I say this to say is, um, sometimes it's best to mind a business that pays you as as black people, and we don't do a good job of realizing our own ingenuity and wanting to safeguard it we look for the validation and approval of other societies um who literally hate us and, and have no vested interest in you know doing anything that is in our best interest um so when we see a situation like uh bobby Shmurda and actually pretty much all black artists dealt with this including prince uh where you know they could have made their own money uh, you know like we said from what i've read bobby Shmurda was making seven thousand or forty thousand a month legal money do a show get your punt get money split split up the cost with the you know the event planner or whatever and you're good and that could have still been going on for the rest of his life he could have still been making money off a hot nigga he didn't get involved with all of the this big music you know stuff like you know and um i remember when he had made those tweets and i remember his mom said oh he's just dealing with success he said i'm doing these toys but i ain't making no money where the fuck is my money i was getting 40 racks a month and now i'm going i signed with y'all and i'm getting nothing where is my money so soon after that uh jail time <laughs> i don't know if y'all if y'all followed that whole situation how some of us was looking from the esoteric point of view and I, well, as soon as he made those tweets and how his mom had to clean it up and now he had to delete when he deleted those tweets i said they're gonna they're gonna pull a rank on his ass and get that hot nigga song up out of him probably own it probably own that publishing and they're gonna uh, get him out the paint for some years because he's not doing you know he, he he's bucking up against it too much and granted he already gave they already gave him the ammunition because he was in a game so it's not like he they were innocent you gave him the ammunition by you by by you know the friends that were uh you know the, the song with it, some mitch called a body about a week ago they really they really listened to that and said oh let's listen to the phone calls you know what i mean once they saw them lyrics and was like let's tap these niggas phones and see what else we could find on them just in case we get something on them you know do what we say look so um black americans please continue to to create but make sure that you just don't always look so 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 everything that glitters is not gold so don't always look to the dominant society to validate your artwork when you are the arbiters and the 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 creators of most art genres and artwork um and within the last uh century last last couple couple of centuries so you do not need to always sign up for like with hip-hop what happened with hip-hop you know, oh, get a record deal. Ooh, I got me a million record deal, and then you broke as fuck the next couple of years. You know, you know, and, and um, uh, the, the way the people, the way our intellectual property has been stolen, and how we have not benefited and own, you know, a lot of these record labels. We don't own 100% own these these things that other people are benefiting from that are not in our culture. So you know, you have uh, Bad Boy. I think he might owns that or whatever, but. I think Def Jam was Russell Simmons, if I'm not believe, but I mean, who hands are all in that, you know? So we have some instances of black ownership, but we certainly could use more, you know? And as far as these black artists don't become a slave, uh, don't sign no, no, read your contract, read your contract uh, several times as much as possible. And don't you want to end up in a situation like Bobby Shmurda where you can make, you know, 10,000, 20,000 bucks a, uh, a month just off of your little YouTube hit. You know, you record it and put it on damn this. Uh, was it uh, Discord? Not Discord. What's the iTunes and TuneCore and all that? Put that shit up on there and call it a day and get your money. You know, you know, just 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 chill and uh, read. If you are gonna sign, read your contract as much as possible three times with the lawyer. Get a dictionary out. You know, make sure the lawyer is not necessarily with the company because they're they're going to look for the company's best interest. Get a get. I, I, I read it th three times. I mean, don't play before you, before you sign that dotted line. Make sure you ain't selling your soul. Make sure there ain't nothing crazy there that say this 
contract is for perpetuity and everything you do outside of music is also owned by the blah, blah, blah. I'm saying I've read some crazy ass contracts, you know. And people try to, you know, you sign up for one thing and they saying if you make anything, any invention, uh, I don't care if it's a shirt, if it's a, a perfume, we get 50% of that and all that. Read your contracts, Black Americans, because as much music as we have produced, as much genres of music we have produced, we have also had a, a, a underbelly, a, a, un, a downside to. Our, our aspect and that is people stealing our shit and putting us in slave contracts simple as that so i want to talk about that because that happened since the beginning of time since the black american has been in this country that happened with blues singers jazz singers r&b singers uh, gospel singers hip-hop uh artists um r&b artists so we're still dealing with that you know uh prince will tell you he's dead now he's our ancestor but um he 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 spoke out a lot before before his uh passing too so we want to for one honor our ancestors by taking control over things we can take control over now which is our artwork and now you have modalities to get it out on the internet you have soundcloud all types of things um and if you could push something and it just happens to pop you know and it, it pops on the internet and, and we are all bop into it trust and bet on the people bet on the people that um They'll come to your shows and put and put, your, and put money in your pocket so you can continue to make money off your songs, you know, and do it that way and build up your money and save your money that way instead of signing some crazy ass deal. So we cover the Black American art. It is uh, very vast. Black American music is is, is so vast; it's unbelievable. Uh, we try to do it as much as, as quickly as possible, you know. Uh, of course, we have rock and roll. I, I forgot to cover rock and roll. Rock and roll is a big thing that that started with Tina Turner and uh, Richard. Uh, Little Richard. Little Richard just died, by the way. And Little Richard is a genius. I mean, he's the one that screams on those records. Tina Turner used to scream on her records. If you notice, rock and roll. When the white people started doing it, they scream on their records. It was black people doing that. Um, and and uh, Tina Turner is phenomenal. I mean, she's she's a force to be reckoned with. So we honor her. And right now, I hear she in Switzerland. You know, so she doing her thing. You know, but Tina Turner, um, one of the most phenomenal, uh, very inspirational to a lot of Black women because of those, of course, beautiful legs, um, but talent and then those beautiful features that she has. You know, those Black American features, and that that you know that wig she would wear. <laughs> so we love Tina Turner and Little Richard. You know, I grew up uh, always hearing about Little Richard. He's way before my time. I, I don't. I'm not really familiar with his music, uh, but I I, would, I know it when I hear it. I know his voice. That's how distinct he is. So he is an amazing ancestor to have. He, he's just passed away. So let's keep him in our memory as well, and and let's let's take notice of our culture of what we have done in terms of blues, R&B, hip hop, jazz, uh, rock and roll, gospel music, uh, the Harlem Renaissance, the literature, the poetry. You know. Um, and those are the things that we are known for. So the last topic of Black Americans and music and art that I want to cover is poetry. Poetry is very important to the Black American, and we remember, you know, like Maya Angelou and Nikki Giovanni. Uh, but poetry um, for us is really huge, and it's really huge for me on a personal level. I don't know if you guys remember. It was a show called Def Jam. It was a poetry night, and most deaf used to host it. When I say that that was one of my favorite things to watch, literally my favorite thing to watch as a as a young kid, because I this was going on, and I think I was about 12, 11, 12. And when I say when Death Jam uh, poetry came on, you, I, I, it was like um, I was like a kid in a candy store, you know, being able to listen to those artists. So. I, I want to thank Mos Def for even hosting that and putting on uh, great programming because they used to feature so many brilliant, brilliant black poets that really, you know, uh, influenced my life and made me feel good as a child. So that is a part of black American culture is a poetry. So that was big in the Harlem Renaissance. But uh, elements of poetry can be found in all of our music. It can be found uh, literally in our uh, culture where we actually do uh, poetry cafes where you can go and see the same thing that was similar to the, um, the, 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 the most deaf uh, poetry jam. So I personally go, I used to go weekly to the poetry cafe and see 
you know the um the the, the, the poetry contest the poetry slam and all that that's just something that uh that we do we go to these cafes and it just be a, a room full of black americans enjoying good poetry and drinks and food so that is something i also wanted to cover and um we covered a lot of artists and a lot of uh people and a lot of uh things in this particular video but i also want to shout out nina simone and lorraine's hansberry because I, I i did not mention them but nina simone is a force to be reckoned in her own right um i'm so many that i'm missing but these are our ancestors that we must remember nina simone you are a genius and we thank you for your incredible incredible um contribution to uh uh, to music in terms of being a piano and you are truly the high priestess of soul you are truly a goddess in, in our eyes so the black american wants to honor you uh nina simone and lorraine hansberry who was a playwright genius in her own right she created uh, a raisin in the sun which was also turned into uh, several uh, variations of, of movies so um it is so many black americans that there are so many black Americans that have literally changed uh, the course of history with their music uh, contributions and uh, contributions to art. And it is something that needed to be talked about in a way that it, I'm very passionate about. And I'm very serious about this because we have so many, even today, we have um, you know artists who are amazing. Of course, we have Beyonce. And she just released, uh, you know, Black is King is one of her latest projects. And I thought that was one of uh, a very beautiful project. Uh, most of her work is awesome. And she's an amazing talent. So I think right now she's she's kind of one of the top, you know, that we have left. <laughs> to be honest, that that is talent, you know, as far as, you know, there's no co-opted. There's no bullshit. She's, she's just genuinely talented. And of course, you know, uh, when you listen to... Beyonce's music we get to see a black American in full force um, creating beautifully as well as her sister Solange which is also uh, black American music like could, when you listen to Solange you could feel the black American in it a person me personally I could feel the hoodoo I could feel uh, our ancestors in that music I can in Solange's music and that's what our ancestors want they want to be able to feel they self in our music they, they, they want to bless us on the other side and they're still with us so we have to remember um all of their names and so many please if you know of any you know just say it out loud as you're listening to this video anyone that you mention because we're generating power from the ancestral level from the ancestral cellular memory to be able to carry on as black americans today and everything that we do and music and arts is just one of them we will always continue to create we've created trap music uh, house music I uh, can't be and, and again uh, we will be sitting here forever if I just wanted to really just go on about everything that we have done but remember trap and then house was was really popular it's still popular now I personally I think house music is so amazing um even though that's not my um you know I didn't grow up knowing about house music until recently because I think that originated in, you know in the Maryland Washington area and I'm from New York so there was no such thing as house music growing up I, I've got introduced to that by black americans and from washington <laughs> and even in uh i think i even met one from chicago i think they got some some of that in chicago now but um you know our music uh capabilities at, uh, and uh, the capability to produce music and the capability to uh literally make whole genres of music that influence the entire world is quite amazing um and black americans you need to be proud of that you need to gatekeep and you don't need to have vultures and culture vultures all in your shit. People who try to steal from you and take from you and make money off of you. You need to be very particular about how you go about benefiting from your art and music going forward. And we're doing a pretty good job of that. You know, you self-publish your stuff and make sure you copyright all of your stuff. Make sure you, um, you know, uh, do whatever you can do to protect your work. And Black America, I'm so proud of everything that we have done. I'm so proud of our Black American ancestors in terms of music and art. And we got some more to go. We only got uh, three more videos. I'm not going to tell y'all, but they're going to be surprises of what we're going to cover next. But I told y'all that we were going to go through some pain before we got through, you know, more of the things that we have done, things that 
that we should uh, absolutely be proud of. And these are the things that we should be proud of. Arts and music, our inventions that I covered in the last video. You know, so I can't stress enough. I, I'm, I'm reiterating the point over and over again. So if I sound redundant, um, you know, I do apologize. But um, we must honor, 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 honor those black American ancestors and music in the arts. And which is the topic of this video. Black American, you have been doing this for hundreds of years, and you're going to move forward and do even more creations, more genres, and continue to keep your head up to the sky. So remember, go put that song in right now, go to YouTube and put in Earth, Wind & Fire, uh, keep your head to the sky. And speaking of Earth, Wind & Fire, they should have been, they, you know, again, there's so many that I missed, like Earth, Wind & Fire, are you kidding me? They are geniuses, like... We love Earth, Wind, and Fire. We thank them so much for everything they have done. The, uh, they are truly a brilliant group. And, and, and I've missed so many groups. I just feel so bad because I feel like, oh my gosh, like um, uh, we need to honor our ancestors. And uh, we may do, you know, an ancestral video. Just, just ancestors. Just, just pure ancestor. All Black American ancestors just honoring our ancestors. Because even though. You know, these are these. This is documented history that I'm showing y'all. As far as like this, this video series, the Black American series is history. It is a documentation of our history. And it is showing our culture. It's showing everything. But it has that spiritual aspect. As far as when I'm saying our our deceased loved ones' name, we giving them that energy, and we're honoring them. And that's very important to me in any uh, telling of history. You know, to honor those ancestors. So that's why I do that. And that's why I have that very unorthodox approach. I curse. I uh, get spiritual. I honor ancestors. I'll share personal stories. So that's what makes it different than, than a traditional uh, docu-series or um, PBS type stuff that you would see. Uh, that's what makes my stuff very much different. But the information is literally still the same. I'm getting this stuff from the Library of Congress. I'm getting this stuff from Harvard. I'm getting this stuff from University of Pennsylvania. I'm getting this stuff from credible uh, scholars and ethnographers and sociologists like I'm not just pulling stuff out my ass you know like I, I do my research I am a credible scholar and I take this stuff very serious but I'm just unorthodox and I'm not you know um you know a part of the machine you know so it is what it is so I love y'all so much please keep your head up and I'm gonna talk to y'all later bye